Hidden in the thick rainforest covering the steep volcano slopes, the world's last mountain gorillas have found a refuge. Join us on a journey to northern Rwanda to meet a young gorilla doctor whose job is to keep them healthy. See his colleagues save a critically injured female gorilla. Follow rangers and trackers as they hunt illegal poachers. They do use different snares. And learn how a new generation of scientists continues the work of Diane Fossey, the famous primatologist who sacrificed her life so gorillas could live. The Virunga Mountains, a volcanic massif of 8,000 square kilometers straddling the border of three countries, Rwanda, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Gorillas don't recognize human lines on the map, so they move freely through this jungle. Rwanda's Volcanoes National Park is home to 500 mountain gorillas, or half of the world's population of this critically endangered species. Most of the gorilla groups that are habituated to humans live here. It's five in the morning. Time for gorilla doctor Gaspar Nzaisenga to begin his rounds. His mission is to monitor the health of 20 wild gorilla groups. Today, he'll be checking the well-being of the 28 individuals who make up the Kuitonda gorilla group. Since my childhood, I loved being with animals. My family used to own cows, goats, so we had various kinds of livestock. I always enjoyed being in the company of animals and then I grew up loving animals. When I was in my last year of university, that's when I met uh, people from Gorilla Doctors when they came to our school. I was really inspired and really convinced that I it was really my dream to become a wildlife vet. We are here in a Kutonda group. Uh, I came for what you call a routine health check, which is to check on uh, every individual in the group to see its health. Now they are feeding, we just find them. They are feeding, some of them are resting. Um, performing health check of every individual that I managed to see here. First, when I arrive in the group, I take the GPS location where the group is. Then uh, I see the vegetation where they are feeding and I see what they are feeding on. Mm -hmm. And I check on the weather. I record all them. I uh, also check the activity, the general activity of the group, if they are generally resting or they are generally feeding. Now, most of them are feeding, but some of them are taking some, some short breaks. From a distance, we can see some of the parameters. We have a set of parameters. I have a sheet here which I feel. There's a, every individual, the name of every individual gorilla in this group is on the list. Then there are several parameters I have to check. Some of them I can check from uh, a distance. Like I check the activity, I check the body condition, I check if they are feeding, I check uh, if they are uh, like some of the discharge, if they can be having some discharge of any mm -hmm. kind of uh, orifice. 
then uh, some of the parameters I can't see them very well from a distance then with my camera and my lens I can zoom in and, and get them really close Dr. Gaspar works for Gorilla Doctors, dedicated to saving mountain gorillas one patient at a time. With only 900 mountain gorillas left in the wild, the health of every single individual is vital for the survival of the species. But carrying that heavy burden doesn't seem to affect this rowdy youngster who is just happy to be alive. An older gorilla keeps an eye on the frisky juveniles. His name is Risanga. Uh, he's a black buck now. Uh, we identify them by their nose print and names. <coughs> Gorillas identify their friends, including humans, by a low grunting sound. They seem very relaxed because they're used to uh, human. They are habituated to the presence of human. Uh, that's why we vocalize when we enter the group, just to make them aware that we are already there. But just like humans, gorillas can be hurt in a bad fall or in a bad fight. We have some, some cases that are related to trauma. Trauma can be uh, resulted from uh, intra-group fightings or inter-group fightings. And uh, the, which can sometimes result in really serious bad wounds, which we monitor. And if in the, the individual gets worse and worse, then we have to support him medically. Today, a team from Gorilla Doctors, led by senior vets Dr. Mike and Dr. Yost, are getting ready to provide emergency assistance. With no mobile clinic to support them, they prepare all the medical kit they might need, even a portable X-ray machine. We got the call that a gorilla was lagging behind from the trackers who monitor the health of the gorillas on a daily basis. And so we organized to go, and the first is a visual uh, observation of the animal, and we could see that it was having trouble lagging behind. If it's serious enough and we, we need to do further work, then we do have to anesthetize them by darting. This animal had suffered trauma, and we weren't exactly sure the extent of it, and we saw indeed that it was broken at the knee. This uh, leg doesn't extend properly either. And then we took the other leg just uh, to do a comparison, and in actual fact, that leg was broken. But the interesting fact is that they weren't both broken at the same time, and I think that this female had broken a leg about a month before this and had been able to get along with the other leg but because she was compromised probably fell again and broke the other leg. The All right, good. She was fully anesthetized. We do that by darting with this chemical uh, remotely. We had to have this animal down for an extended period of time because of the complications with the, with the uh, leg. And so we actually put her on gas anesthesia so that we could keep her down for an hour or two. Take this off for a second. For extended periods of time, we like to intubate. It helps us control their breathing, and if there's any emergencies, we have total control. Okay, move it. That. We had this very nice uh, digital battery-operated x-ray machine. Okay, we're ready. Maybe should have. 
What's that? From? No, I thought maybe we should have changed the settings, but it's it's okay. You can you can see it well enough. Well, really well actually. That we were able to see, we we looked at the the uh, leg that we were concerned about, and we saw indeed that it was broken at the knee. The arms okay. It's deformed a little bit, or not deformed, but it's an unusual configuration. But both legs, both knees are broken. I don't know whether she fell from a tree and busted them both. Or... Gorillas not unfrequently fall, and I think that this female had broken a leg about a month before this and had been able to get along with the other leg, but because she was compromised, probably fell again and broke the other leg. If we this, cast the other one... Cast the other one we should. We knew that we couldn't cast both legs because we, we'd have to bring her into captivity for that. And we don't do that because of conservation uh, is in the wild. And so the, the left leg was the most uh, acutely broken and badly damaged. And we were hoping that she would be able to use the right leg still. Now, I think the question or the thing to do is to put the cast on. We have about two or three minutes to manipulate the leg after we put it on. Time is running out and Dr. Mike and Drs. Joost and Fred will have to make a critical decision. If they don't line up her bones correctly, the young gorilla may not be able to walk and will likely starve. Deep inside Virunga's massive, the vets of gorilla doctors are hard at work in their portable jungle emergency room. You try to manipulate the bones so they're in very good alignment, but that's difficult then to put the cast on because you've got people with their hands in the way. I would have pulled it and stretched and then put the cast on. But okay, then, then let's do that. Let's do that. So you can sometimes put the cast on, and while you have the three or four minutes to set it, you can try and align them. It's doing the job. It still feels horrible. All right. Well, I'm sure it's very painful. Under anesthesia, it's not so bad, but you could tell how much pain she'd been in before we put the cast okay. on. So natural, yeah. Ready? Okay. Okay. Um, that's not in position. It's better than it was. I see the open eyes. We, we were monitoring closely, but it's just a matter of turning the gas up and down and monitoring. We, we do need to pull it a little bit more somehow. Lateral or medial, do you know? This is the t tibia. So this is lateral. Yeah, pull more and we need to put pressure on there. And so pressure on, on the femur and push that towards medial, medial, cranial medial. A gorilla that can't get around is a problem because they're then uh, open to predators, even feral dogs in the park. Although they're vegetarians, they could, they'll probably be able to feed enough, but I mean, to, to be able to get from one food location to the next, they have to be somewhat mobile. If you can push the femur that way, and I pull, <clears throat> like that. You're, you're happy with what you have right there. I, I, think, I think it's in the right place. So we casted the left leg hoping that by immobilizing it in the cast, she would be able to utilize that and therefore allow the right leg to heal completely and the left leg to have quicker healing. Okay, let's take an x-ray, see where we're at with that. The x-rays were paramount here to tell us whether we had the cast on properly or not. Ready? Yep. We were quite comfortable with the immobilization and the casting, so it was, to us, a successful intervention. The vets are satisfied with their surgery while their patient sleeps off her anesthesia. Hopefully, it's a small successful step in a big effort to save the world's last mountain gorillas. Prosper Nitwanjeri manages Randa's Volcanoes National Park, where mountain gorillas have the space to thrive. This park is special 
in many ways. Uh, the first one is, is a very, very small park, just uh, uh, 160 square kilometers. But uh, in it, uh, for some decades, we have uh, kind of uh, uh, done a, a very good work uh, for conservation, especially uh, or, or the conservation of mountain gorillas. So it's a success story uh, for the mountain gorilla conservation, but also the conservation which benefited, uh, you know, a lot of things like you know the biodiversity of Volcanoes National Park in general, but also uh, uh, the communities living uh, near the park who in the past were, were the problem, but now they are kind of a solution, uh, actively involved in uh, protection and the conservation of the mountain and gorillas and the park in general. Through the tourism revenue sharing, we have invested in uh, providing water, building schools, especially investing in the next generation. We have also supported uh, several cooperatives and uh, many people have uh, some positive stories about how their livelihoods have changed because of the park. But again, you know, it's, it's a process. Uh, it's coming slowly. Uh, the population of mountain gorillas is increasing. We have seen already some indication that say gorillas need more habitat because they are more and more coming into a kind of a regular interaction with the people. They come outside uh, looking for, you know, uh, bamboo or even uh, exploring new food like uh, uh, feeding on uh, eucalyptus. We are thinking in a kind of a flexible way, thinking of a kind of a buffer zone uh, where, you know, we can see what, uh, what is possible be done, how do we manage the conflict between the park and the communities, trying to prevent buffaloes from coming outside. Every successful conservation manager in Africa has to balance both the carrot and the stick. Abel's men carry the stick. He's the unit leader of rangers protecting both the mountain gorillas and the visitors who come to see them. Well, one of the threats we have in the Volcanoes National Park is poaching. And when poachers are in the park to trap animals, they, they do use different snares. This is a rope snare, and uh, this is uh, mainly dangerous for small baby gorillas and antelopes. They, they have a techniques for coming and setting them so that once the animal is trapped within, uh, it can amputate some legs, some part of the body, and this is very serious, and uh, when you are coming for patrols, when you found them in the park, we remove them. Rain or shine, Abel's rangers go out on their daily foot patrols. Law enforcement in and around the park is very important because uh, when you are conserving a national park, we do face problems. To have people who are tempted to enter the park for fetching water, for collecting bamboo resources, for collecting honey. And on the other side, you have other activities that are caused by parks animals. For example, here we do have a serious problem of buffaloes, which sometimes uh, went outside, damages crops. We do call it buffalo stone wall. This stone wall is here to demarcate the boundary of the park, of course, but also the main role of this wall is to protect community field uh, against human with drive conflicts. They are maintaining it to have it sustainable so that the animals are contained within the park. This has been built uh, sometimes 10 years back and it is 76 kilometers and it's all along the park. For sure when I was a little boy I was a fan of nature. And from that, I have that kind of being attracted and addicted to nature conservation. In Rwanda, gorillas are animals that are well known. And having gorilla conserved 
having them visited for tourism purposes, it contributes to the economy of the country and it contributes back to the community. Rwanda makes $305 million a year from gorilla tourism. And that would have been impossible without the sacrifice of primatologist Diane Fossey, who first publicized the plight of Rwanda's mountain gorillas before she was killed by poachers 30 years ago. Italian scientist Veronica Vecellio from the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund continues on her mentor's sometimes bumpy path. She's researching the dynamics of the last three generations of mountain gorillas and how to build a conservation model to make sure there are many more generations to come. Okay. We take this way. I have been inspired though when I was uh, very young by watching the movie Gorillas in the Mist. It was actually Diane Fossey who inspired me to start practicing this job and then I ended up working in Rwanda that is is like a dream coming through. I've gathered a lot of memories with uh, gorillas and uh, some days more than others uh, you have really the feeling of a great connection. Uh, I remember one very special day has been probably the the most special day with gorillas when I was uh, in the middle of an intergroup interaction. I was following Bitsme group at the time and on that day Bitsme was 26 gorillas uh, and then we suddenly met the trackers that were following Pablo group that at the time was 63 gorillas. So in uh, less than a minute like more than 80 gorillas were in the uh, same spot screaming, the males were strut stunting at each other and, uh, and then they started fighting and we were right in the middle of them where gorillas were just running all of our side just by interacting. They were a very uh, excited situation for, for them. That is, uh, will stay one of my greatest memory, maybe the greatest memory. Once the, the gorilla group are found, then the researcher can start uh, the collection of the data that uh, can be done by a GPS, by following a gorilla movement, or uh, by recording the behaviors uh, between individual gorillas and uh, also by recording everything is happening in the group uh, in the large uh, scale, like if there is an intergroup interaction, if uh, a female transfer from a group or another, and the reaction of uh, the, the group where the female transfers. So they spent the night here and, uh, and then they took this path uh, in the morning. We spent four hours with the gorillas, uh, following uh, individual gorillas uh, with this method that is called focal sampling. So each gorilla is followed for an hour and uh, everything happened to this gorilla for that hour is recorded. Like uh, who is uh, close to whom, the proximity to other gorillas, the behaviors uh, with other gorillas. In, um, in addition to that, we also collect uh, fecal samples, urine samples, and this is very important to understand uh, the genetic, for example, of this population, because from fecal samples you can extract the DNA, and this is also an ongoing uh, study since many, many years that uh, serve us to understand uh, the genetic of this population. We know how many gorillas there are through census work, but we can also know the, um, the specific dynamics of uh, gorillas, individual gorillas and gorilla groups uh, inside this population that is growing. We need to know how the gorillas are responding or adjusting to this uh, uh, increasing number of gorillas for then uh, having a real understanding that will help to save the gorillas and to protect them. Thank you.